Being obsessed, I guess I would say passionate, Cornelia, um, with derelict terrain. I have been trying to find a way to regenerate degraded land to include citizens uh, by having them witness and even better participate in derelict sites transformations. Vast territories of contaminated land by their very nature exclude us. Our task is to reclaim the relationship between this troubled land with the men and women who worked there and to regenerate its health for generations who will continue to live there. The good news is that it's now painfully clear for the longest time it, everyone was in denial, some people maybe still are, that we cannot do industrial business as usual. But there's bad news, that there is a bad habit of wanting to cover up the site's problems with a green pastoral ideal. The challenge then is to adopt a holistic approach that would embrace these troubled landscapes, these ugly ducklings, as authentic reflections of ourselves. I think we need to trespass into a place where there is no such thing as a Mr. Fix-It master plan. We must be willing to work with tough sites as we find them. We can impose an ideal image. We must work with an economy of means because the fact is they're very, the budgets are low and design cannot afford to be a luxury anymore. We need to work with communities to help them find a way to connect with orphaned land. Conventional engineering that dominates our environment usually seeks to stabilize urban and industrial systems, but by contrast, us crazy uh, um, designers try to figure out how to work with this crazy flux. So instead of offering a steady stream of picture-perfect places, we can suggest a cyclical series of dynamic actions. Instead of that nasty master plan, a dynamic action plan might have unknown results, but it's a method that might guide people towards seeing beauty, even in the unexpected. Again, greenwashing obscures that view of authentic possibilities. We must resist the application of static camouflage and chart a course of transparent transformations. The emphasis here is that casting a course of action is a primary act of design. The working methods are precise, but the formal results are provisional. In a systems-based approach, the primary proposition is less about the designed thing in itself, but more about a catalytic, a catalytic process where the desi designer, when we are long gone, communities know what they can do. Derelict terrain in cities and degraded land on the urban fringes is regarded by many people as empty and formless. Design is, is dependent upon finding form without those voids, within those voids. The imperative is working with cycles of growth and decay. Fact. Millions of people increasingly live in exploding megacities, but on the flip side, thousands continue to flee shrinking cities like Detroit, leaving vast tracts of abandoned land, land in their wake. Fiction. These post-industrial shrinking cities, like Philadelphia, have the money to redevelop vast abandoned acres with green industry, shiny commerce, and happy housing. Again, it's all too easy to sweep social and economic pro problems under the green rug. The uncertain future of shrunken cities is daunting. But designing with uncertainty is possible when you rigorously investigate the forces at work and figure out how to strategically intervene. If you can find this convergence, convergent point of resilience, it is the most inclusive place of all. Inclusive places invite a multitude of different people to adapt to an evolving landscape in a multitude of ways. 
Design as research fortified by interdisciplinary collaborations equips us to forge ahead into this troubled te territory, like this landscape in southern Pennsylvania polluted by acid mine drainage. In both my practice and teaching, I've had the incredible privilege to work with fellow designers, engineers, and scientists, historians, and artists to investigate ways to address degraded realities. Again, this is a, um, a, my learning curve here of um, learning how to uh, treat acid mine drainage through a passive treatment system. I've strived to teach a generation or two now of design students to learn how to uh, understand the complexities of post-industrial sites and form formerly urban land. They must, I insist, work with the existing warts and all. So tonight, um, this is Dirt Studio. <laughs> uh, we are this tiny. We do often uh, wear protective clothing. Um, but we stay very small in order to form uh, um, project-specific teams, again, with artists, historians, and scientists, sometimes some architects, if they're nice ones. So I'll be sharing some uh, dirt studio projects, built and unbuilt, a lot of unbuilt since some of them, well, we get fired a lot. Um, one, uh, depending on site. Working with the existing emerged, as we all know, from ideas about site specificity, that's decades old, that rejects the imposition of idealized gen generic forms in the favor of particular, if not peculiar, dynamics in place. My hero, Robert Smithson, reminded us, uh, remind us, always reminds us, if you read and reread him, as I do, that the landscape is process and that the physical stuff of landscape is merely a reflection, yes, the pun, of those processes. This way of working is a, uh, sets up a type of call and response, a process that is not only site-specific, but absolutely site-dependent. Site-dependent design is contingent upon giving form, but more aptly gaining form through a series of critical observations that, gu that guide each subsequent action. A series of observations with no preconceptions what something like these water supply tanks would become. Decisions are rigorously based in that place, yet they are openly provisional. The outcome is completely reliant on what's there. The water line on the walls tells the story of the water stored there. Leave it. The water in the pipes is still there. Turn it back on. The concrete is there. Smash it and rearrange it. It's about being resourceful. It's about using restraint. Meanwhile, in Philadelphia, at the, uh, at the um, axis of, um, uh, from the city center down to the Delaware River, there's a commission for urban outfitters or anthropology, maybe some of you folks are wearing some, a huge re uh, clothing uh, retailer. The task I feel in working with a private enterprise like Urban Outfitters is actually to defend the public and to insist that some public realm is indeed at the core and part of the infrastructure um, of what would be their new uh, corporate camp campus. I had to constantly remind the um, founder and owner who I worked with closely, uh, which was great, but sometimes very awful, um, that there were hundreds um, of men and women that worked uh, uh, at the Navy Yard long before Urban Outfitters were going to move in onto League Island. Um, and that, in fact, um, it's a, still a very, very productive landscape. Virtually half the island is being redeveloped. The other is an active um, shipyard. And guess what Robert M. Stern wanted to do with it? Yes, make it into a shiny, happy place. 
hardly anything having to do with this. So one approach here was not to make a watercolor master plan, but to in fact work on an action plan. This fuzzy, scribbly um, drawing you see here is when I'm sitting beside um, Dick Hayne, uh, the founder, and talking about what the bones of this landscape are. Um, and those being a great amount, being the real lines, those beautiful arabesques that would be the productive lines that um, wove together the site. Uh, the initial part, the first phase, they're now on phase four. They're doing quite well. Everyone is buying a lot of clothing. Um, were these five buildings um, around the historic core of um, dry dock number one. And as you can see, pretty fantastic scale. And this is part of what we um, uh, always look for, of course, as many of us do for those, in those historic photographs of looking for those traces. And sure enough, we started to find the crane way, which you'll start to see, the huge crane way that giant crane, not to mention the big, sh uh, big ships. And meanwhile, um, and this is what you would, we would find on site. So site forensics would start to happen in terms of us looking at very, oh, sorry, these small cracks in the asphalt and getting extremely excited because I knew a rail was underneath there. We are also looking for, in essence, a, a sustainable word, the embodied en uh, in energy of this place. And my interpretation of that is the embodied en energy beneath that surface of folks like Judy Garland coming and uh, uh, entertaining thousands upon thousands of um, Navy folks and of a, a whole history of making, which have now is, um, uh, being done by other folks with wafy, wafy material. And then there's scale, 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 scale. Um, always love, I always quote Adrian Hoja when I, he's always would say, no sissy landscapes, build it like a motherfucker. And I tell my, I tell my students that. So I always say, you think that's big? Add a few zeros. So, but a, what a beautiful, uh, context to work within it had so much to work with that in a lot of ways I don't feel like we designed this site we simply revealed it all we needed to do was to um, see those rails coming up through the surface we need to do some detective work um, in the uh, old drawings to see what we would find underneath if you look behind where I'm standing we are doing archaeological dig um, that's where we were uh, looking to see um, where the rails and some concrete or whatever else we would find were going to be. And this is where I actually had to teach a contractor not to demolish, but to salvage. So that we were doing a salvaging plan, not a demolition plan. So we thought I was rather crazy because I X those par uh, par spots and asked them to carefully stockpile that many um, uh, truckloads of uh, concrete not to go to a landfill. And then I uh, worked uh, again with what they termed uh, Barney Rubble, if you guys know the Flintstones, um, and placed them with care and made the uh, site 800% um, more permeable. So that a space between building 12 and building uh, uh, 12 and 15 would simply be composed with the rail as now carting creative uh, designers from anthropology to their studios. And I always kind of thought it would be funny, funny to do really femme things like put cherry trees in this massive landscape for future designers. And there's nothing for me that says more than to find, you know, ancient footprints, maybe not ancient, but at least I felt like they were dinosaur-like of shoes and concrete and even more contemporary marks like yellow 
um, yellow lines on asphalt. And to, in this giant landscape, to have both immensity and intimacy in this wild and woolly landscape. And to celebrate it as crunchy in the winter. And again, to look at all of the debris we had and crumble it all together and come up with another member of the Flintstone family, Betty Rubble. And this is a, 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 um, a drawing for us measuring the amount of material that didn't go to the land, um, landfill. And I never showed this to the owner because any time I said anything about any environmental or ecological agenda, he would accuse me of being a radical liberal the Republican in him. And from then on, I never, ever said anything about, about it. It was pure aesthetics. So I just snuck anything sustainable in the back door. <laughs> and there's Betty. Betty snuck in the back door. Um, uh, giant, giant hedgerows shading now. They've grown up past the second story windows to uh, protect solar gain on the west side of the, um, of the buildings. Again, I didn't say anything about that to Dick. Um, and then when it came to another phase of uh, building a landscape around the dry dock, I'd had to defend the public realm. I always called this landscape a park. And Dick had trouble with that. And I said, Dick, this is going to be a park for the Navy Yard. It is not a, uh, a place for urban outfitters. So all we had to do again wasn't much of a design. We just revealed the rail. We did some arabesque projection of the steel walls around uh, the rails to immerse people again in this immense landscape, but with some intimate... Uh, texture to run through, an everyday runway, huge uh, place for the increasing number of employees, but for people all over the Navy Yard, boys and girls clubs come here, um, but it's also very much about this. Setting in motion. It is daunting to think about uh, d design is site dependent when you begin with a formerly urban landscape like this one in Detroit. But again, a careful look reveals a valuable cultural landscape with layered histories full of local stories. But what do these wildscapes say and how do we encourage people to listen to them? How can we reframe frame landscapes like this with a positive perspective with minimal means? How does... Uh, um, how does design set things in motions without overly manipulating what is there? Again, this takes cues from Smithson in his conceptual work, Asphalt, Runs Out, Run, Asphalt Rundown. The choreography, again, is exact. The outcome is a calculated guess. Here, the precision is orchestrating the process, but not in predetermining the form. Design is an active verb, and form is an active verb. Verbs engage, and they are inclusive. The focus of this project um, by my alma mater, um, Harvard, uh, luckily we're far away because I did sign a non-disclosure act, so if anybody is here, I'll pr I can get sued. Go right ahead. I like to tell on them here and that how insensitive they were to the uh, community of Alston. Because th the idea here was to create a course of action rather than to conduct a formal exercise. It was very practical. It was about moving a lot of dirty dirt. So again, the question would become, how could the community witness, understand, or better yet, participate in the future of their landscape in relationship to this privatized landscape campus? Alston is this amazingly wonderful working class neighborhood across the um, river uh, from Harvard, from Cambridge. Um, the, the area uh, for redevelopment is outlined there in white. The master plan by a teacher of mine, God bless him, uh, but was full of street trees and privatized courtyards. 
there was going to be a massive amount of soil moved for all the basement parking. So dirt, I guess appropriately named here, this is one of my drawings or my inventory of all the different type of material that was there. And lo and behold, what we found was actually the perfect ingredients for um, um, healthy dirt. Uh, so we came up with a whole series of potential uses um, for that dirt um, and how it is it could be reused on site and if any had to be exported, it could go to another uh, of the many, many sites that Harvard owns around the world, seemingly. This is a drawing we showed to the, cons uh, to the client to make the point, if you see that, the dump trucks are times 100 of all of those, to make the point that this would possibly have some impact on the community. They actually gasped when they saw this. They would, this would have the impact of all those dump trucks rambling through this community of Austin. So what we did was come up with a dirt dance and how it is, again, that we could choreograph um, the use of all that soil right within um, not too long of a distance. Um, we actually found, luckily enough, uh, an old rail that wasn't um, uh, taken away, which led to this giant former slab of a Sears manufacturing site. Because some of the soil was, as they called, downtown brown, um, it could have some contaminants in it, but we found that they didn't. It was just like funky debris. We had to have a lined um, uh, surface, an impermeable surface to do this soil manufacturing. So lo and behold, there it was right in the neighborhood. So our idea was that um, the, uh, the, um, the railroads would be bringing back and forth this soil. What they were basically doing is up no north there in the oxbow, of course, is the up there is peat, right, soil, so it was sinking, so they were rebuilding the uh, sports field. But the idea was be that the, um, the spur would actually become a greenway for the community, a public greenway for the community to go from their neighborhood up towards the river. And that um, the neighbors, in a way, would witness, would witness um, this manufacturing of soil and I don't know about you, but I like heavy equipment and piles of dirt. Um, with uh, the big mud action plan, this was, uh, this was part of a uh, project that was conceived of by the artist Mel Chin uh, called Operation Pay Dirt. Um, and the big thing here was the collaboration with the scientists was very, very critical and it was the only way the project could have been conceived. Um, and it basically creates a network. Again, it's about a strategic course of action for the uh, uh, citizens uh, to be able to deal with their problem of what Mel would call the disaster before the disaster. The, the map you see underneath there is lead, leaded soils. And then, of course, we can recognize Ms. Katrina up top there. So we worked with Dr. Howard Milkey from Tulane University uh, to map the levels of lead. Um, uh, the palest at 400 parts per million is the US Environmental Protection Agency's limit of when it's, um, uh, it's damaging. So you can see um, uh, a good amount of territory is highly, highly polluted with lead. And we're all familiar with this image of dangerous buildings, but then there's also the dangerous ground that was beneath many of these buildings. And perhaps we had a bit of a perverse idea here that while the um, ground was exposed that we should think about rebuilding New Orleans from below the ground up. And we worked with um, Dr. Milky um, on a, uh, um, a process where um, the lead, when you add phosphate, in this case we used Apatite II, uh, combines with the lead, it transforms into pyromorphite, which is, uh, renders the lead in another form that is not bioavailable. 
lead is not taken up by sunflowers. I hate to burst everybody's bubbles, but it's, they look nice, but lead is going to be forever in the soil, and all you can do is um, make, you know, render it inert. So our idea was actually, how do we take these active ingredients, which was the phosphate amendment, and then we were going using six inches of clean sediment, which they had plenty of uh, in New Orleans from uh, the floods, and then restore some of the 75% of the canopy that was lost during Katrina. Um, so that uh, what it would make in all of these side yards with the uh, shotgun buildings would be healthy landscapes. And the sediment came from the Bonnet Carey Spillway, which is 30 miles um, away from uh, New Orleans, uh, a huge um, tonnage of this clean sediment ready for use. So in fact, New Orleans could probably make a business out of um, treating leaded soils. We did our homework about how many um, uh, cubic yards of uh, sediment would be needed throughout the neighborhoods. And we came up with a nested scale of operations from extra large to extra small and came up with an idea of all the different participants um, at all those different scales. So at the uh, extra large mud, mud depot, it would be like contractors um, uh, in trucks coming and getting all the um, active ingredients. And then in sites like this that were in the middle of a block, those would become mud squares where a job, there could be job crew um, training, there could be de demonstrations, there could be testing of the soils, and that was working at the scale of a um, wheelbarrow. And then the extra small sites in backyards would have the participation of not just free volunteers, but paid um, job crews. Finding the formless. Many writers, filmmakers, and photographers, all, um, along with uh, landscape theorists and designs, have long uh, recognized these urban voids or Turan Vag is subject of our contemporary condition. They are an essential mirror of our cu culture as reflected in um, Wings of Desire. Again, Smithson recognized that creating work is pr primarily about the concrete act of casting a glance. And he laments, especially when it comes to the uh, subject of um, the landscape, quote, nature is indifferent to any formal ideal. So, what is the role of the designer in these provisional landscapes? Bring huge land, tracts of abandoned land can't possibly be, de be designed in a normative way. Practically and even conceptually, it doesn't make sense for these wild places to be designed with a capital D. Design is a verb. Find, finding the form of a landscape growing on its own terms and that is working with its logic, not our logic, is a, is a legitimate act of design. Then, finding our, then we find ourselves within that logic, and that makes what I guess we would call a park. This project, uh, collaboration with Stephen Stimson Associates and a whole bunch of um, local consultants of wildlife biologists, hydrogeologists, it tested our ability to find that logic within this wild Texas landscape, bigger than our logic could ever fully comprehend. Um, ironically, we won the competition uh, without spending enough time on the site, so we threw our scheme out. Um, I don't even want to show it, because it was so stupid. Um, and we started over. We, re we rejected um, uh, it because it was too much of an imposed master plan and instead an idiosyncratic syncretic design strategy depended uh, completely on what we found there, the systems working on the site. And we did careful um, subtractions and very careful uh, um, additions. So this was the site, crazy post-agricultural land that we conceived of as this kind of 
combination and a hybrid of the Texas landscapes of these wild oak woodlands um, and the agricultural or more cultivated um, uh, mission landscapes. So we introduced the idea of a cultivated wild. And a lot of it was about seeing. Um, we actually asked that folks could come onto the site immediately. We had second Saturdays where all of the team members were stationed across the 300 acre um, uh, site to begin to teach uh, folks how to see. Um, they thought it was nature and we had to bur burst their little bucolic bu balloons by saying it was highly degraded landscape and to educate them about what restoration, conservation, um, uh, and all those Asians um, had what possibilities they had in the park. So we began to scribble back and forth. These were the times of, of going back between Dirt and uh, Stephen Stimson Associates, uh, finding those, coming back from the field work and finding those pockets of um, important areas. Uh, it here the um, subtractions and additions of uh, really working with the existing landscape mosaic that you see in the lower part, and then coming up with this idea of more cultivated areas um, uh, within that larger mosaic. Um, here's where we were talking about um, having some orientation lines, because a lot of these things, when I talk about it in subtractions or additions, it may sound timid, but it was not timid at all. No sissy landscapes. Um, so that these lines were very emphatic, yet letting kind of the insanity of the landscape mosaic um, speak. Uh, and it was very interesting. I was the sacrificial lamb in front of the public who was insisting on active recreation to tell them all that um, there was the majority of folks who um, wanted to maintain the crazy landscape mosaic of woodlands. Uh, and um, luckily I, I wasn't run out of town. Um, but that was the night we made a pact with the community that 75% of the landscape mosaic would be uh, preserved and, and restored, and 25% of it would become more of this um, uh, cultivated landscape. Um, the Park Service loved us because they only had a high maintenance regime for 25% of the 311 acres. The tough part is the public then kept us to every single acre, which was great. So, simple stuff. The three sisters, as we called them, only needed a trail and a couple lines of local limestone. We went out on the site and hugged on every oak we could. To keep people immersed in that woodland. We put in very, very long uh, um, picnic benches, which was actually a cultural reference to um, uh, the Hispanic families, much to the chagrin of the white neighbors. Slap them down with a picnic bench. And then uh, a celebration of um, the crazy uh, limestone uh, landscape of San Antonio with that perch above. That's my friend Steve looking over. Ah, yes, the High Line. The High Line. The High Line. Just so you know, the team I was on lost. We got second place. Which, if you remember, second place is always the best game. And because the client doesn't have the balls to to, you know, to do you know build the uh, build the right one, so uh, but it I always lament about this, and yes, I am still a sore loser. But I find that what pains me is having spent so much time um, up on the High Line before it became a park, and to experience how incredibly wonderful and wild that place was 
before some goddamn designers got their hands on it. Shame on us. Oh, so the found wilderness of the High Line was a, land, was a landscape that our team, Terragram, led by Michael Van Volkenberg, um, described as, quote, demonstrating its own ecological logic without aesthetic meddling that draws, its, uh, draws life and purpose from what exists. And as you know, it's a mile and a third. They just um, completed the last segment. It was, um, as you know, a working landscape with ballast coming from around the world so that there was uh, seeds from coming from around the world that made for this incredible wild and woolly landscape growing definitely with its own logic. These incredible photographs by Joel Cernfeld let us all fall in love with it. But this is where I look at this photograph and I think of the Friends of the High Line, the organization that gallantly saved this, this landscape, which, believe me, is, is fantastic in and of itself, that we have, even if it's a facsimile of wilderness, it exists. And we are one step further towards having genuine wilderness as a legitimate part of our um, urban landscapes. This is a, um, a, our first meeting where we literally almost pricked our fingers and made a, pack, a blood pact that we would, we would um, love the High Line for what it is as it is. And that all we had to do was to show people what it was. We asked questions about the am amount of money that was going to be necessary to overhaul it and then um, uh, maintain it, which is um, an astronomical amount of money, and we felt we could be more resourceful. We knew that basically it was about training people to see um, and to listen to what was there, and that all we needed to do, perhaps, was to dial up, you know, some of the sun, capture some of the water. We had to just ma manipulate um, some of the processes already at, play, at, um, at work and also to absolutely keep uh, folks on the side, keep them off the high line. We had to explain succession. Not an easy thing to do when we can all see the subtleties in, uh, in this matrix, um, but boy, oh boy, when you are talking to, you know, sexy people in New York, this does not cut it. You gotta, they go, what, what, what do you see? And we see um, actually some amazing possibilities of eco-curators, of folks um, gathering seeds to um, cultivate um, that there wasn't a separate thing between environmental changes and human interaction, that um, maintenance, care for the, not maintenance, care for that landscape could be ongoing with citizens. And all you had to do was just do simple, simple stuff. Just put in a stair, damn it. And use an old uh, park um, device of a meander, that it was the context around the, um, the juxtaposition of the high, high line wildness. Funny, this is what the last segment is starting to look like. Thank God they ran out of money. But as you know, this is what they got wild. And this was an early drawing I did, fearing the worst for the High Line. And that's what they got. Not the solitary experience of a wild. So, got that out of my system, didn't I? 
It's difficult to comprehend how such seemingly abandoned landscapes can be see, seen as laying in waiting, just fallow, waiting for their seeds cast by urban pioneers, waiting to germinate for the next productive evolution. But it is what we are seeing in cities that don't depend on colorful master plans, ones that have to come from within, regeneration from the bottom up, because regeneration from top down ain't working in a lot of these places. They're inclusive because it's inclusive to be working with what's there because of um, uh, who's there and who has stayed there, who have to stay there, and it's the only way a city and neighborhood will plan to stay, uh, will have the ability to stand, stay. We are often outsiders that need to find the insiders to include and encourage communities to advocate for healthy places to live and work, to inspire them with what is there and what is not there. They have a lot, they just are having trouble seeing it. We can offer direction into unfamiliar territory that represents the hard work of generations before us. We can be guides into a frontier of authentic urban landscapes that represent the future of our cities with all the optimism these three kids say, when they say, I can find a way to be resourceful. I know what we can do to set good things in motion. I found it and I can give it to others. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Stay. Take center. Oh. Thank you, Julie. I thought we have a couple of questions before we sit together here and talk that might be directed specifically towards you. Okay. So if we can have some microphones walking around. I would like to start with a question about the negotiations that you described that mm. you sort of have to do all mm. the time on all <laughs> levels to access and to have space to push on and move on and do things differently. And yeah. you just now mentioned the finding the insider yes. to make it possible. Can you, can you just elaborate a little on this, uh, how to sort of navigate hmm. in, in that terrain? You just made mm. me think of a story. Well, who knew? <laughs> who knew? <laughs> um, it's actually, uh, many, many of you guys have, I'm sure, used the, uh, the device or the way in which to find the champion of the project um, that is not yourself because you go away. Um, and I'm thinking about the environmental, um, I worked on the River Rouge, the Ford River Rouge, uh, plant, and the guy um, uh, in charge of um, the environmental division. Uh, I, I was very strident then, you know, and was just like, you need to do the right thing. They were going to tear down the historic Coke ovens there, which was, you know, incredible. Then the first, very first uh, manufacturing, integrated manufacturing plant, they were going to tear down an essential part of that story. I mean, crazy, mm. crazy. So Jerry Amber, I remember him now. Um, we, that was when, when they were doing an environmental ass uh, assessment, we got a historian on our team. Historians are fab. You gotta have them on teams. Because I think we try to do site histories and I think we do a just okay job. Historians, this historian just like went deep. And he told the story so compellingly about these Coke ovens that Jerry got it. And he understood that what would be really poetic is if we did the regenerative, the remediation gardens of the PAHs, the polyaromatic hydrocarbons. Wow. Yeah. I'm impressed. Uh, mm. <laughs> uh, believe me, it took a long time. Uh, being um, treated right in juxtaposition with the Coke ovens. So, um, so 
pretty poetic. The mm -hmm. next years and years later, and this was Jerry Amber who used to wince when I came in the room. He'd just be like, oh no, not her. Mm -hmm. And years later, the next time I saw him was at the, a Wildlife Habitat National Convention, and he got up there and talked about the Ford River Rouge. Wow. And how, you know, and he talked about that as his project. Mm -hmm. And he had ownership of the story. He, it was his project. Mm -hmm. Go Jerry. Yeah, wow. Wonderful. So that's, that's how I do yeah, it. That's how you do it. Great. M questions from the audience? I know you have them. Just spill them out. Comments. Reflections. Reactions. Protests. <laughs> songs. <laughs> Come on. This is your chance. How many people really like the High Line? I do. I like Have it. you been there? One more. Have yeah. you been there? Yeah. Have you been there? Yes. yes. Did you see it before? Yeah. I'll rest my case. We'll get there. No We're questions? Getting there. Yeah? Hello. A question about it. It's, um, I, I really like the story. It's, it's extremely, it's, it's, uh, it's a story that I can, and can recognize by the High Line. Of course, there's a, there's a lot of quality in it. But... Um, you're talking about, in older projects maybe, you're talking about the, the choreography of uh, the dirty dance, which is, it is very dirty. Mm. And it, 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 it is maybe very difficult to explain mm. the, the beauty of it. Um, mm. Aren't you every now and then, uh, uh, don't you feel that you maybe need to sex up your story a bit, as you were saying about the sexy <laughs> and New Yorkers, that you... You feel like maybe if I throw in a bit more happy people and, 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 <laughs> and sunny pictures that they will buy it. And then we have it actually. We have this mm -hmm. really wild uh, high line. Is that something that you feel you need to do maybe every now and then? Yeah, um, you, um, you remind me of, of uh, a way in which um, I uh, present um, and talk with communities about projects. Uh, especially ones that are the ugly ducklings. Um, and I have found, um, and I've witnessed other landscape architects uh, presenting uh, to uh, communities that have these kind of troubled landscapes. And um, some with some beautiful, beautiful evidence still there, although they haven't been presented with the idea that they're beautiful. I think too often we um, I, I remember being at one of the uh, presentations where landscape architect only showed like pictures out of landscape architecture magazine. Like, wouldn't you like this? Wouldn't you like this? Wouldn't you like this? They didn't show one photograph of the existing site. And uh, I always make a point of doing that. And it's amazing how when you're up there telling them their own story, right? And that this, you know, beautiful thing with this patina is an artifact of their hard work. I've been asked them if it's beautiful. Mm. And they often say it is. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julie. Yeah. You're okay. not allowed off stage. You're allowed to sit down there and take part in this discussion. Okay. <laughs> right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.